in the, uh, in the book of Revelation and to going through. And as we began last week with the sealed judgments and went with the first four, referred to as the four writers of the apocalypse, uh, leads us into Jesus again removing the fifth and the sixth seal uh, in the rest of this chapter. And, um, and with that, uh, we're looking, as they say in verse 17, uh, the comment is made, for the great day of his wrath has come, uh, and who is uh, able to stand? It's a phrase used uh, many times. It's an uh, eschatological or end times phrase. And when we began our study in Revelation, we uh, we said that it was important to really have a foundation in the Old Testament because it's quoted 400 times. And, uh, and this is one of those chapters where we're going to see uh, some of those phrases quoted as well. Uh, it's also spoken of as the day of God by, by Peter and 2 Peter. A day of darkness is used by Zephaniah and Amos. And, a, and certainly the day of, of Jacob's trouble is a phrase all describing this day of uh, and period of time we call the, the great Tribulation. I just wanted to read uh, one of those uh, couple of verses from uh, Zephaniah there in chapter 1, verse 14, talking about our, our study, what we're going to look at this morning. The great day of the Lord is near, he says, it is near and hastens quickly. It means when it comes, it's going to happen very rapidly. It doesn't mean from the time I say it, it's going to happen next week. It means when it comes, it will suddenly be upon us, and these events will happen uh, very rapidly and, ha and catch people by surprise. The noise of the day of the Lord is bitter. There the mighty men shall cry out. That day is a day of wrath, a day of trouble and distress, a day of devastation and desolation, a day of darkness and gloominess, a day of clouds and thick darkness, a day of trumpet and alarm against the fortified cities and against the, the high towers. So uh, again, we're uh, in our study still in what we call the first half of the tribulation. I've got a couple of slides here for you just to kind of review in, in a timeline to show kind of where we're at. Again, we're waiting for the rapture of the church as we get to the, uh, the first part of the tribulation. We went through last week the first seal uh, judgment, the white horse, which really is a picture of the Antichrist coming on the scene. Uh, the, the red horse, and again, red is in blood. We talked about the devastation that will come uh, in terms of the, the numbers that will be die during this time period, the, the black horse, the uh, ashen or the horse that looks like death warmed over would be another way of expressing it. Uh, we're going to look at the fifth seal that Jesus is unveiling there and uh, the souls that are slain at the altar of God, not slain there, but they're at the altar of God, having been slain, crying out for some sense of justice. And then uh, six, the lamb's wrath, or again, the cataclysmic events, supernatural disasters that come upon the earth. The seventh seal then begins the seven trumpets. Uh, and by the time we get done with those, we're at the midpoint. We're 21 months or three and a half years into the tribulation. Why don't you go on to the, the next slide and, and you can put all those up all at one time if you want, Kathy. It'll take a while to go through. Just to kind of get the bigger picture, uh, here's Israel's first gathering, second gathering. You've got the uh, again, the, ra the church age and then the rapture of the church that could take place. And of course, uh, from everything we're studying and looking at, we're on the edge of the edge of that. And we live in a time when Israel has been gathered back in the land in, in unbelief. And then we know that uh, during the tribulation period, there will be thousands or possibly hundreds of thousands of people, men and women, children that will come to faith in Jesus Christ uh, but among them, certainly, at the end is the nation of Israel itself as they cry out uh, to the Messiah, and they will look upon the one they have pierced and mourn for one as one mourns for an only child, as Zechariah says. And when they do that, that will usher Jesus Christ back to planet Earth for the second time. Israel will be gathered back in the land again at that point in, uh, in belief, and then, the, uh, and then we go into the, the millennial kingdom of Christ. It was interesting talking to uh, David Hawking one time. He was saying that uh, J. Vernon McGee, which we, we all love to listen to him on the radio and so forth, but J. Vernon McGee at one point in his life uh, did not believe that Israel being back in the land since 48 right now was a fulfillment of Bible prophecy because after all, they were there in unbelief. Uh, and by unbelief, we mean they don't believe in Jesus as being their Messiah. Uh, certainly, 
uh, they practice their faith, they go to synagogue, they honor the Shabbat and so forth, and they believe in God, they read the scriptures. Uh, many of them, it's, uh, it's a secular nation, but, uh, but many of them have their faith and trust in God, but they've never received Jesus as the Messiah. So therefore, they're in the land in, in unbelief. J. Vernon McGee said, therefore, it's not a fulfillment of biblical prophecy. David took him through those scriptures that are listed there that said, no, they are drawn back into the land in unbelief. Uh, and then there is a time when they come to faith during the tribulation and they will then reoccupy Israel in, uh, uh, in belief. So that's kind of where we're at in the big, big picture. And those two blocks probably help us understand that much of the tribulation, again, is about God dealing with the nation of Israel as the church and the church age has ended and we've been raptured and we're, we're with the Lord. Well, let's go on and take a look at the, uh, the fifth seal and it reveals uh, the persecution of, of believers and we uh, get a glimpse of heaven once again and a couple of particular things in verse 9. When he opened the fifth seal, I saw under the altar the souls of those who had been slain for the word of God and for the testimony which they held. And they cried with a loud voice, saying, How long, O Lord, holy and true, until you judge and avenge our blood on those who dwell on the earth? Then a white robe was given to each of them, and it was said to them they should rest a little while longer until both the number of their fellow servants and their brethren who would be killed as they were was completed. So the first thing we mentioned is that the fifth seal reveals souls under the altar, uh, which uh, leads to another question in terms of um, when did they live and when would, were they martyred? Uh, obviously, the, the term that's used, slain, can also be translated to be butchered. Uh, it means they were murdered. Uh, and, uh, and it was used also, that same term, to describe uh, a sacrificial animal as it was uh, being killed. So there are these souls, these men and women, uh, who are at the altar of God that are crying out for some sense of justice on behalf of God, uh, and they have been killed for their faith and for their testimony, uh, but, but who are they? And uh, the most common view is, because I'm going to give you a couple, the most common view is that they're tribulation saints. Uh, the tribulation is ongoing. The Antichrist uh, is uh, the rider of the white horse, has come on the scene saying that he's going to bring peace, but actually uh, death, as we saw last week, is right upon his heels, and there'll be a great persecution, uh, and these are tribulation uh, saints. Uh, if that's the case, then how do they get saved? Well, the answer to that is in chapter 7, as we'll look at next week. God will set aside during, and we're about ready to read about some of these cataclysmic supernatural events that are taking place. God will set aside 140. 4,000 Jewish billigrams, Jewish believers that have placed their faith in Jesus Christ that are gifted for this particular task of taking the gospel around the world, and God is going to put a seal on them and supernaturally protect them so they cannot be killed or injured by uh, the Antichrist's forces and so forth. So the gospel is going to be getting out there. People are going to hear, uh, turn to Jesus Christ, and, uh, but they are going to be martyred for their faith and here they are in heaven. And that again, chapter 17 is, tells us who's specifically doing the persecution. And that is this mystery Babylon, a one world religion that will exist during this time that will support and enhance everything the Antichrist is doing. And they will have their own false prophets. So it's kind of the unholy trinity that exists during this time. And we looked at verse 6 of chapter 17 last week, which says she was drunk with the blood of the saints. So uh, so that is the most common view that these are tribulation saints. They've heard the gospel and they've been martyred. They've been murdered uh, for their faith in Jesus Christ. <clears throat> the second view uh, is that um, they are the martyrs of, uh, of, of history, the Old Testament saints, uh, as well as uh, the, the church age saints. I have a tendency to lean uh, a little more in that direction because chapter 7 is going to introduce us to the host of the tribulation saints and give very definite details in regards to who they are. So uh, I kind of fall in this view and, and if it uh, lends credence, so does David Hawking. So, <laughs> but, and, and what it's all based on is, is one phrase where the text says they had been slayed and it's in the, uh, the perfect tense, which means it's an event that's happened in the past. So these are people that have been murdered for their faith in Jesus Christ 
in the past. And now they're at the altar of God uh, and they're crying out. And um, if that is uh, who they are, then uh, they are described in Hebrews 11. And we mentioned uh, one of them, Isaiah, in our study as we began Wednesday night. Isaiah is mentioned in this passage. Remember, he is the prophet who was uh, basically taken under arrest by Manasseh, a very evil king in Israel. Uh, his father was a very good friend. Isaiah had been a been a mentor to his father. He comes on the scene, very evil. He eventually arrests Isaiah, ties him between two trees, and has him literally sawn in two. He's described here as well. Here in uh, Hebrews eleven thirty-five, 35, uh, speaking of these that were, that were martyred, others were tortured, not accepting deliverance, that they might obtain a better resurrection. Still others had a trial of mockings and scourgings. Yes, of chains and imprisonment. They were stoned, they were sawn in two, were tempted, were slain with a sword. They wandered about in sheepskins and goatskins, being destitute, afflicted, tormented, of whom the world was not worthy. They wandered in deserts and mountains and dens and caves of the earth. And all these, having obtained a good testimony through faith, did not receive the promise. Now again, they are Old Testament saints, so they were waiting for the promise of the Messiah to come. They placed their faith in him uh, coming in the future, which uh, obviously he did, and they were saved. Uh, and they, so this says in verse 40, God having provided something better for us, because we're on this side of redemption or this side of the cross, that they should not be made perfect apart from us. We're all saved uh, by the blood of Jesus Christ. But uh, again, a, uh, a description of what these men and women, and sometimes children, have gone through in the past in terms of Old Testament saints, and certainly that continues today. And when we talk about martyrs of the church and persecution, uh, we usually make reference to the fact that in the last century, there were more men and women children martyred for their faith in Jesus Christ than all other centuries combined. It's not getting better, it's getting worse, and it's going to get worse, and it's going to get worse, uh, and it will be a, a horrific time uh, during the tribulation. A couple of things about them either way in terms of martyrs. Uh, they have a special place in the heart of God, and they're honored in a unique way. Now, we were introduced, and we saw ourselves, church age believers in heaven, a few weeks ago, the song of redemption that, uh, that we sing and so forth. Uh, but here, uh, these, uh, these individuals are at the altar of God. They're specially designated, different from uh, uh, other believers in heaven. I think that indicates that uh, they have a special place for the heart of God. Also, when it says they're found under the altar uh, in the tabernacle, which was, in a sense, a picture of the throne room of God in, in heaven that Moses constructs there in the tabernacle, two altars. There's an altar of incense, and then there's the sacrificial altar. That's the altar that's being spoken about. And again, when an animal is sacrificed, his blood was being put under the altar. So they are under the altar, in a sense. They're in a special place in heaven because of their blood that was spilled because of what they have experienced through persecution. And then the last thing is the text reveals why they were killed. I think there's some good application for us here. Two reasons why they're killed. Notice, for the word of God and for the testimony which they held. So uh, as one writer said, they were killed because of their convictions and because of the fact they communicated those convictions to others uh, around them. And... Um, it's one thing to have convictions about the Bible, about Jesus Christ, about uh, salvation and so forth. That's okay with a lot of people. If you have your own little personal conviction, they're okay with that. That's okay for you and what I believe is okay for me. Just don't communicate them. Just don't share them with anyone because if you do that, you're crossing a line. And uh, we live in those days now. You have, to be, you have to be very careful. I was just talking with somebody uh, in the military, and they were saying, yeah, hey, I met another believer at work, and it's really great, but, you know, when we're the only ones there, then we can kind of talk about the Lord and everything. It's great when they're the only ones there, because they have to be very careful what they say uh, in, in particular settings, whether you work for the state or the city or county. Uh, a lot of settings these days, you have to be very careful. Can you have your convictions? Sure. Just don't communicate them. It's kind of the message of the world, and there's a lot of forces in, in our own country, of course, to remove Christianity, a witness for Jesus Christ, out of the public arena, out of the political arena, uh, and so forth. And we've seen 
politicians uh, just very recently be uh, tremendously persecuted uh, simply if they stand up and speak on behalf of, uh, of Jesus Christ. Not that way in the, in the public sector so far, and that's a, that's a good thing uh, in terms of uh, work, at least in, in some places, if they're sympathetic to the kingdom of God and the, uh, and the cause of Christ and so forth. Charlie was just uh, sharing about, uh, they just, we've been praying, they've been praying to get this big contract that they would keep uh, all their guys working for the next two years with Disney out there and, uh, in the Coppola area, and they, uh, they got that contract on, on Monday, praise God, and he can give you the details, totally, totally a miracle, and, but they got it, and there was, a, there was a, lot of, a lot of praise and worship going on <laughs> with all the uh, uh, really supervisors, engineers, and all the top guys in, in that company, so apparently it's okay in some arenas, it's okay to be an athlete, be a Christian, that's okay. You can get away with that. Certain, uh, you can be, like I said last week, you can be a country western music singer and be a Christian. That's okay. Uh, it's just certain arenas. You can't cross that line. And yet, really, that's what God's calling us to, isn't it? Not just to have personal convictions, but actually to communicate those personal convictions to others. Uh, Paul had troubles in his day, and yet he said, I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it's the power of God to salvation for everyone who believes, first for the Jew uh, and also for the Greek. For in it the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith, as it is written, the just shall live by faith. Now in chapter 1, uh, John kind of uh, talks about this idea of his words and his testimony and what he's communicating, as well as his own convictions. Uh, and then in chapter 12, verse 11, he, he says this about other believers during this time period. It says, they overcame him, the Antichrist, Satan, evil, by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of their testimony, and they did not love their lives to death. Certainly, there's something we can learn from them. If they can overcome, how do they overcome in these kind of circumstances that we're talking about? Well, it was by the blood of the Lamb. It was by the righteousness that was imputed and given to them through Jesus Christ, the power of God in their lives, and by the they actually said it. It was by the word of their, uh, of their testimony. There's kind of that famous quote. It gets attributed to a lot of different, different people. But uh, it's that whole thing of uh, share the gospel and when necessary, use words. No, you pretty much got to use the words. <laughs> no one is going to get saved just by watching you. You, if you live out your life with integrity and somebody watches it, it may pique their interest uh, it may give you a platform. Sometimes we say we have to earn the right to share the gospel with others by the way we live our lives, and that is absolutely true, very important. But you still got to tell them. You still got to tell them. Uh, and that's the idea here. I want to follow this a little further. Revelation 19.10, there John is, uh, uh, he is there, and uh, he comes upon this uh, angelic being, and uh, he does what most people seem to do, and that is you fall on your face. Uh, and then the angel addresses him and says, uh, hey, <laughs> don't, don't do that. Get, uh, get up, you know, and uh, this is a little conversation. But the angel says something very interesting here in, in verse 10 of chapter 19. He says, and I, John is saying, I fell at his feet to worship him. But he said to me, see that you do not do that. I am your fellow servant and of your brethren who have the testimony of Jesus. Worship God. Now, it very interesting, it says, for the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. And uh, our testimony, so important. The testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. Uh, well, I think one of the applications of that is certainly this. If we study prophecy, we know what's going to happen in the future. We study this and we know there's going to be judgment, horrific times that come. Uh, but we also know that, uh, that the church age believers, we're going to be caught up in the rapture and we're going to be with the Lord. He's going to place robes of righteousness on us. He will give us rewards and crowns for what we've done in his name, though he's the one giving us the opportunities, giving us the abilities and the gifts and the talents and so forth. We still get awarded uh, for it. Uh, we know that we're going to be around his throne and worshiping him. We know that all the injustices of this world are going to be dealt with. We know that Christ will return to planet Earth, uh, where he will establish his kingdom and where we will live with him 
forever and ever. We know that because of prophecy. So again, he's saying that Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. We know what prophecy is, and therefore, if we're really getting something out of this, it should make its way out into our testimony of others. What is the testimony of Jesus that we should carry on our lips? We win. We win in the wind. We may have difficult times. We may be going through hard times, but we know the end of the story. We know what's going to happen. We know what's going to happen to other men and women and children, whether they accept Christ or they don't accept Christ. The spirit of prophecy is the testimony of Jesus Christ and what he's done for us and apparently what places them at the special place in heaven, in a sense, close to the heart of God, is the fact that they were willing not only to have convictions about what God's word says, but they actually took the next step and communicated that to others. It cost them their lives, but uh, nonetheless, that's why they are where they are uh, in terms of, of heaven. Uh, the next thing about the seal that is opened, we notice that it's uh, an appeal for vengeance. Uh, they appeal to God's character in a sense of justice. And we, we talked about that we, last week in the introduction and spent some time developing this idea that the primary reason that these things are happening and this judgment is coming is that it's God's vengeance being poured out on all of those that have murdered his followers, men and women and children. And God says, enough is enough, and his fury is unleashed we say, upon a Christ-rejecting world. But notice how they make an appeal. They say, How long, O Lord, holy and true, until you judge and avenge our blood? Because God's holiness demands justice. They don't say, How long, O Lord, you're so loving. When are you going to pull out your vengeance? How long, O Lord, you're so gracious. When are you going to pour out your vengeance for what's happened to it? No, they, they make an appeal to his holiness that he's true, that he will keep his word. And, uh, and they are crying out on that based upon his character. Why do the, we sometimes say that now, just like the psalmist, why do the wicked prosper uh, and the righteous suffer? You ever ask God that? I ask God that once in, a, <laughs> once in a while. How did that guy get promoted? He's an idiot, you know, and it's like, here I am. I'm working myself to death, and you're up there in heaven. You're calling the shots. What is up with this? And God says, wait a little longer. You know, I'm going to do what I do, and I'm in control, and, and be patient with me. But, uh, you know, every time we watch the news, and there's just been, it seems, a, a litany of horrific things of uh, small children that have been kidnapped and abused and so forth, and then they get out, and the guy does it again, and it's like, we're upset by that. I don't know if you're upset by that. I get ticked off by that. It's like, where is justice being done? I think God's put that actually in our hearts. That's why a lot of people are intrigued by television shows that involve, will they get the bad guy? Will justice be met out here? You know, you don't go, go to a movie and watch it, and then in the end, the bad guys all go free. That's not going to be a popular movie. You know, there's going to, those bad guys are going to get it in the end, and we're going to go, yeah, because it appeals to something in our heart that God has placed there. There should be a sense of justice. And, uh, and these men and women are crying out at the altar of God, when will it happen? And, uh, and they make an appeal based upon the fact that he is holy and his word is true. Secondly, they make an appeal uh, based on the fact that he is sovereign over the affairs of, of the world. Uh, notice they, they say, they, they call him Lord. You are the Lord. You are the master. Uh, and uh, when will you bring vengeance? Now, for us, even though <laughs> we may cry out for a little vengeance uh, in our own lifetime, uh, our mission is a little different. And maybe, maybe we'll be in heaven crying out for vengeance someday too as well. But right now, how do we deal with the inequities of this life? Well, Paul tells us in Romans 12, if you want to turn there, it's uh, to your left, a few pages. I know you're all getting very lazy as I give these verses to you each week up there on the PowerPoint. But, uh, but uh, actually, there's several verses. So uh, I want you to turn there so you can take a look. Paul here in chapter 12 is going to lay out what is our response? You know, do we get to cry out for vengeance and be like uh, uh, James and John, the sons of thunder? Hey, they don't like our message, God. Why don't we just call some fire down from heaven and take care of these guys here? You know, 
That's not exactly what the Lord would have us to do. In fact, Paul says in Romans 12, 14, Bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse. Rejoice with those who rejoice and weep with those who weep. Be of the same mind towards one another. Do not set your mind on high things, but associate with the humble. Do not be wise in your own opinion. Repay no one evil for evil. Have regard for good things in the sight of all men. Uh, if it is possible, as much as it, it depends on you, it won't always be possible, but as much as it is possible, live peaceably with all men. Beloved, do not avenge yourselves, but rather give place to wrath, for it is written, Vention is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. Therefore, because God's going to deal with it in the future, therefore, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he's thirsty, give him a drink, for in doing so, you will heap coals of fire on his head. I think that's meant to be a compliment and not you're hoping his head sets on fire. Uh, you may have attempted that with a boss at work, giving him food, thirst. Uh, but again, you're trying to win him over. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. So that's our, our response. Our response is not to seek vengeance, but to give place because God will deal with the injustices uh, of, of this life. Now, Paul does go on and say that uh, uh, it's not like we can't do anything. It's not like, well, you know, hey, there are enemies. We're just going to keep doing them good, and we'll just let evil spread around the world. That's not at all. He goes right into the next passage uh, and says that, uh, that everyone must submit themselves to the governing authorities, where there is no authority that exists except that which God has established. And he begins to talk about government and how God has given, given the sword to the government so that they can protect and deal with the evil uh, of this world the best they can. That's why every, every man and woman puts a uniform on, whether it's in a, a local police or FBI or the military, and they rise, raise their right hand. They swear to protect <laughs> and defend the Constitution. They are actually acting out of chapter 13 of Romans. They are fulfilling a God-given ministry to go get the bad guys. Uh, and prevent evil from the best we can from spreading uh, in this world. So there's an institution for dealing with it, but individually we're to repay evil for good and, and uh, let God deal with the vengeance uh, in, in the future. But anyway, these men and women are out there, uh, up there in heaven. They're crying for, for vengeance. Uh, the, the fifth seal also reveals the reward they will, excuse me, will receive. Then a white robe, verse 11, was given to each of them, and it was said to them that they should rest a little while longer uh, until both the number of their fellow servants and their brethren who would be killed as they were martyred for their faith was completed. And uh, so they're told to wait a little while longer. I've taken from David's uh, book, Coming World Leader, uh, kind of modified a couple of things. I'm calling uh, five theological conclusions uh, and from this, and one of them is that the dead are conscience, uh, and they're aware of the promises of God. There's no, no, no idea in the Bible of this idea of soul sleep, or we're just kind of mindlessly hanging out in heaven. Now, we did cover the part last week about the church in heaven, or a few weeks ago, uh, playing those harps and singing those worship songs, and don't really have time to practice the guitar these days, so I'm really encouraged by that, that uh, this is... Uh, going to finally get it together and be able to do that one of these days. But uh, nonetheless, there is that part. But uh, we note the fact that they are conscious and they're conversing with one another and with God in heaven. And they're very aware of the promises of God. When they pray, they know how to pray. They know how to make an appeal in terms of to his holiness and, uh, and, and so forth. Secondly, the dead are conscious and aware of the righteousness of Christ that has been given to them. Notice the white robes that they, will, they are given. And, uh, and again, in the next chapter, in verse 14, it says, when the tribulation saints are given robes, white robes, these are the ones who come out of the great tribulation and washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. So it's, again, symbolic, certainly, of the righteousness that we have in Jesus Christ. Paul says in Romans, on more than one occasion, that when we come to faith in Jesus Christ, his righteousness is then imputed. It's a legal term. It's given to us, and it's given to us once and for all. And uh, you may not feel righteous uh, a lot of the times, uh, but your feeling 
and your acting has nothing to do with your state of being in terms of the way that God views you. At the same time, uh, you don't get more righteous as the years go by. You can't get any more righteous than what Christ has made, uh, made us already. And again, he does that by his grace. Uh, and if you're not, you're not sure about that, then, then ask David McKenzie the name of his dog. And he will tell you, my dog's name is, does anybody know it? Titus 3.5. We are saved not by the righteous things we have done, but because of his mercy through the washing of rebirth and the renewal of the Holy Spirit. So anytime you're doubting how righteous you are, you just go to Tracy or David and say, what's the name of your dog? They'll tell you, you'll turn to that verse and, uh, and you'll remember it uh, every time. <clears throat> a beautiful, a beautiful passage. So uh, the third thing we note about them is that dead believers are resting. I like this part. You're going to rest a little while longer. I'm kind of come ready I'm ready for that, but uh, sometimes a little rest. But notice that it's just for a while, and then activity will continue. We won't spend our time in heaven floating on clouds, playing harps, and so forth. But God has things for us uh, to do uh, in his coming kingdom. For God's plan is right on schedule. It's according to his timetable. Will you do it now? No, I won't do it now. I will do it in my timing in the future God's got a schedule. It's going to be kept. He is in control. Uh, and then the fifth thing is what we've already mentioned is that many believers are killed for their faith during the tribulation period. So the fifth seal reveals the persecution of, uh, of believers. The second thing is the sixth seal, as we get to it, records a series of supernatural disasters. Verse 12 I looked when he opened the sixth seal, and behold, there was a great earthquake, and the sun became black as sackcloth of hair, and the moon became like blood, and the stars of heaven fell to the earth as a fig tree drops its late figs when it is shaken by a mighty wind. Then the sky receded as a scroll when it is rolled up, and every mountain and island was moved out of its place. So uh, the sixth seal records a great earthquake. Uh, many of the prophets in the Old Testament warned about these earthquakes uh, Jesus says in Matthew 24, verse 7, that nation will rise against nation during this time period at the end, uh, a kingdom against kingdom. There'll be famines, pestilence, and earthquakes in various places. All these are the beginning of sorrows. In other words, earthquakes are going to begin to multiply as we head to this time during the tribulation. At the end of the seventh seal of judgment, there's a great earthquake. At the end of the trumpet judgments, there's a great earthquake. At the end of the bowl judgments, there's a great earthquake. Uh, but it's not like anything uh, anyone has ever seen before. I don't know if you ever go to the USGA site and look at the earthquakes. I, I, when I read these passages, I do that. As I was watching, as I was on the site, uh, a thing popped up for a 5.5 earthquake in Bali that happened uh, a couple of days ago. And of course, that freaked out more than a few people because of the tsunamis and everything that came from an earthquake just a few years ago uh, there in Indonesia. Uh, off off uh, around the southern part of the big island and off the coast, there was about 12 or 14 earthquakes uh, in, in the last week or so. Anything from one point up, it registers. But if you go on the map of the U.S. and just go three points above or 5.0, it's amazing the, the amount of earthquakes uh, uh, that are taking place all around the planet. But they're going to culminate uh, in a great earthquake, so much so that it creates panic among world leaders. The sixth seal records also a change in stellar space. The sun, the moon, and the stars are all effect, uh, affected. Uh, and again, Isaiah, Joel, and Amos all prophesied about this over 2,500 years ago. Joel says this in chapter 2, verse 30, And I will show wonders in the heavens and in the earth, blood and fire and pillars of smoke. The sun shall be turned into darkness and the moon into blood before the coming of the great and awesome day of the Lord, and it shall come to pass that whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. For in Mount Zion and in Jerusalem there shall be deliverance, as the Lord has said, among the remnant whom the Lord calls. So uh, we're going to read again in a moment that there, a lot of people are just going to be running into the mountains and caves saying, fall on us and hide us because they recognize this is being done by God. Uh, there's other people apparently that are going to cry out uh, and be saved according to, to Joel uh, Isaiah says that all the hosts of heaven shall be dissolved, all the heavens shall be rolled up like a scroll, all their hosts shall fall down, 
and the leaf, uh, as the leaf falls from the vine and as fruit falling from a fig tree. Very similar to the language of, of John here. <laughs> Jesus says the same thing in Matthew 24, 29. Immediately after the tribulation of those days, the sun will be darkened, the moon will not give its light, the stars will fall from heaven, and the powers of the heavens uh, will be shaken. I don't know if that would concern you if all the stars fell out of the sky tonight as you were outside and began, you know, whether they dissolved or some of them hit planet Earth. If the sun tomorrow was blood red, uh, or excuse me, was uh, black in the, uh, and the moon was turned to, <clears throat> again, this is uh, language, it's, it's like, it's not blood, but it's like blood red. And uh, all of the prophets describe that's exactly what's going to happen, and there's going to be tremendous and in widespread panic uh, with people all over the earth. We're still, we're not in the worst of it yet. We're just still in the first half of the tribulation. And uh, we've already mentioned that during this period of time, about 1.7 billion people are killed on planet earth, according to the, to the scriptures. And by the way, this is not hell. <clears throat> this is just the tribulation period. Uh, the sixth seal also records that all the mountains and the islands are are removed. And I heard someone teaching on this a few weeks ago, and it you know, finally hit me that Hawaii is not an exception. <clears throat> that all means all. So that means that uh, every, every person living in the Hawaiian Islands will, will either accept the Lord, uh, but either, even if they don't accept the Lord, they're all going to die during the first half of the tribulation. Uh, California's a long place to swim to. I don't think anybody will make it. The island's gone. Even if somehow you could survive whatever, you know, earthquakes that uh, create that, uh, nobody's going to uh, survive. Uh, I think that uh, we should do two things, and I mentioned this early in terms of, of prayer. I think if you, if you believe like I do that we're living... At the end of the end of, of the last days and, and the rapture of the church could take place uh, at, uh, at any moment, then you should be setting aside some period of time every day where you have a prayer list and you take it out and you begin to pray for your family and friends and, and neighbors you're, you're sharing with and pray for their salvation and pray real hard and pray real often. But you, I think it's, uh, we would all agree, is that a good idea to do? Oh, yeah, that's a good idea. Uh, is everyone going to, oh yeah, we're, we're going to do that. Okay. <clears throat> but I think sometimes it doesn't happen because we don't plan on it. <clears throat> and I think you have to plan on it. You set aside, it's either when you get up or it's you go to bed or it's when you eat your lunch or it's, it's something in your routine of your day. You figure that's my time. That's the time I'm going to do it. <clears throat> and these are the five names or these are the 10 names or these are the, <clears throat> maybe you've got 45 names. So you're going to take <clears throat> five a day or six a day and and you're just going to be systematic. I'm sorry, that's just the way <clears throat> my brain works. I have to plan it. I have to be systematic about it because life is busy and it won't get done otherwise. And I think it's serious business. <clears throat> the other thing is uh, that I would kind of at least suggest you do is um, uh, Pastor Bill, when we began to start the church, you know, whatever, and, and talk about it anyway about 25 years ago, and Bill's got a heart for Kailua. This is what he, where he first lived. It was a long drive to the North Shore <clears throat> to go surfing, a longer drive to town where a surf shop was, and then he'd come back to Kailua. But when they, he and Danita first moved over here a number of years ago, uh, they lived in Kailua. And he said, every time you drive over the Pali or the Leaky Leaky and now the H3, and you look, other than being caught by the sheer beauty of the place that you live, which is, is pretty awesome, uh, look out if it's at night, all those lights recognize they, they all represent homes and people's lives and during the day, see the population that's down there and then just ask God to simply pour out his spirit and work at the hearts of men and women and children to draw them to faith in Jesus Christ. You can do that in a couple of nanoseconds <clears throat> just as you come out. Don't pull over your car on the H3, pray a little and take pictures and so forth and be arrested and say, well, my pastor said, but uh, just as you're driving along, safe rate of speed, so just to look out, ask God to pour out his spirit uh, and, and save men and women and children because we don't know how much time we have left. The fifth seal reveals the persecution 
of believers and martyrs have a place, special place in the heart of God. The sixth seal reveals a series of supernatural disasters, all predicted by the prophets. Uh, and then thirdly, the reaction of unbelievers includes an acknowledgement of God. That's in verse 15 to 17. And the kings of the earth, the great men, the rich men, the commanders, the mighty men, every slave and every free man hid themselves in the caves and in the rocks of the mountains and said to the mountains and rocks, fall on us and hide us from the face of him who sits on the throne and from the wrath of the lamb. For the great day of his wrath is come and who is able to stand? First note that the reaction of unbelievers includes all mankind, the entire population, but note the listing of world leaders to begin with that are filled with uh, fear and a sense of panic. And it's certainly, uh, at least maybe we've seen on television, if we've never experienced uh, uh, panic, you know, mass panic in, in, in a crowd and so forth. But it'll be a horrific time, and it seems to affect everybody. Secondly, the reaction of unbelievers will be to hide. It's so bad, they just want to, want to uh, get inside of a cave, uh, get so, if the stars are falling out of the sky. I mean, you're looking for some shelter. And they're actually asking the rocks, fall on us to hide us from what's, uh, what's going on out there. And then they, they somehow, they know, they know that this is, this is from God. This is a judgment from God. And... Um, I think in the West, we, we, you know, uh, people here don't make that connection. You know, we can, as we've done in the past, we, we can pressure Israel as we did to give up the Gaza Strip, give up land and so forth. Uh, and then we have some kind of a, a horrific thing in terms of natural disaster happen to our country. Pure coincidence. We make no connection. People that track those things can give you date and time, date and time. Because God says... I'll bless those that bless you to Israel. I'll curse those that curse you. Uh, there's a cause and effect. Uh, we, don't, we don't, when something happens of a great magnitude, we don't uh, naturally wonder if God is judgment. Is this a judgment of God? In terms of the general population, it's interesting because they, uh, they do in India. And I saw it firsthand when, when I was the, there uh, a number of years ago, there was a, what, what is called a super typhoon. Uh, that hit the northeast part of India in the state of Orissa. Uh, and it was uh, devastating. Tremendous loss of life and, uh, and uh, tremendous damage to, uh, to buildings and cities and property all along the coast and so forth. And uh, now what was interesting about being there, we weren't even near the thing, but uh, seeing it reported in the news there and what people said about it there. And what they said in this predominantly Hindu uh, culture and, and country was, it was a judgment of God against us. And it was the judgment of the Christian God against us. Now, why would they say that, the average man on the street living through that? Uh, well, it was because the year before, a man named Graham Staines, who was a missionary from Australia, working uh, in India, working among the lepers with his family, was driving along one day in his car on January 22nd, 1999, He's got his uh, 10-year-old son, Philip, and his 6-year-old son, Timothy, in the car with him. They are surrounded by a group of fanatical Hindus. And, and again, Hinduism has its equivalent of jihadists uh, that, that persecute the church there. They surround his station wagon and set it on fire, and they burn them to death uh, in the car. Because they were Western missionaries, it was on the news all over India, and about a week later... Uh, his widow got on national television and told everyone that she wants them to know that she forgives the men that killed her husband and her children. And they can be forgiven by God if they put their faith in Jesus Christ, that he died for all of our sins as she shares the gospel on national television. Everyone sees it. Everyone knows about it. A year later, a super typhoon, typhoon hits Orissa, the state where that happened, and they went... God's doing this to us because of what we did. That's what's going to happen during this time period. Now, what's interesting to me is that people aren't just crying out to, to be forgiven and, uh, and repenting of their sins. It's just kind of a, a mind-boggling thing. But I think of uh, John 3, 19. John's writing the same author, author and he says, uh, this is the verdict. Light has come into the world 
but men loved darkness instead of light because their deeds were evil. There's some people that because of who they are at that point, they're, they're not going to change, they're not going to repent. But again, we know that, uh, that many will. Uh, and again, the last reaction, the reaction of unbelievers includes this question of who can stand or who is able to stand, which is echoing a passage in, uh, in Malachi. So God's wrath, again, tribulation, horrific period of time. It's going to last seven years. It's divided up into two parts. We're still just in the beginning. We've just completed the seal judgments. And uh, next week, we get a reprieve. And we get to <laughs> a scene in heaven uh, once again before we see the uh, trumpet ju judgments uh, unfold before us. Well, I had... Um, Two conclusions, if you want to hear the first conclusion of this message and then get the CD to the first service, I'm going to give you a second conclusion here. Now, if you want to read later, what I would, uh, uh, it's in your notes, but uh, Psalm 46, but uh, I'm not going to read it, but it basically is we went through the Psalms, uh, and you can read it, now that we've had this study, you can read that Psalm and imagine someone during this time period opening a Bible and reading Psalm 46, and it's like, the earth is shaking, the earthquake, all this stuff is described. And what should you do? Turn to God. He's our refuge. Uh, and he's going to protect his people and so forth. And I think God's going to use his word in a powerful way in the lives of, of people during this time that will simply open it and read it because they will read what they are going through and then read the solution as to how to overcome the fear, the panic, and all that they're going through. But uh, in terms of this, uh, this scene in heaven, that, uh, that we've seen already once with the church age believers. Now we've seen what I think are those that have been martyred in the past history uh, for their faith in Jesus Christ. Next week we're going to uh, look into uh, the tribulation saints uh, in heaven. Uh, their, their message, what's said to them, is, uh, is a little bit differently. But I had come across this quote from uh, Charles Spurgeon all the way back in uh, July. It's part of his, uh, one of his devotionals that's uh, posted... Um, uh, each morning, if you, uh, you follow his devotion, the, the morning and evening. But here it talks about uh, our position in heaven. Now, again, Paul says that our, uh, our citizenship is in heaven. And, and we eagerly await our Savior from there, the Lord Jesus Christ, who, by the power that enables him to bring everything under his control, will transform our lowly bodies so that they will be like his glorious body. Now, of, of our citizenship in heaven uh, that we're, we're actually a part of now, but we're certainly uh, will be far different once we are with the Lord, Spurgeon says this, uh, the glory which belongs to the, and again, Spurgeon lived a few hundred years ago, so uh, a few little King James words thrown in here or there, you'll have to kind of uh, bear with him, great, great preach, preacher. The glory which belongs to the beatified saints belongs to us. For we are already sons of God, already princes of the blood imperial. Already we wear the spotless robe of Jesus' righteousness. Already we have angels for our servitors, saints for our companions, Christ for our brother, God for our father, and a crown of immortality for our reward. We share the honors of citizenship, for we have come into the general assembly in the church of the firstborn, whose names are written in heaven. As citizens, we have common rights to all property of heaven. Ours are the gates of pearl and the walls of crystallite. Ours are the azure light of the city that needs no candle nor light of the sun. Ours the river of the water of life and the twelve manner of fruits which grow on the trees planted on the banks thereof. There is not in heaven that belongeth not to us, things present or things to come, all are ours. Also as citizens in heaven, we enjoy its delights. Do they rejoice over sinners that repent, prodigals that have returned, so do we. Do they chant the glories of triumphant grace, we do the same. Do they cast their crowns at Jesus' feet? Such honors as we have, we cast there too. Are they, are they charmed with his smile? Is it not less sweet to us who dwell below? Do they look forward, waiting for his second advent? We also look and long for his appearing. If then we are thus citizens of heaven, let us walk 
and actions be consistent with our high dignity. And it is a high dignity, and it is a high calling. And, uh, and that's what Peter would say. You know, how should we then react to all of this? And he says, live holy and blameless lives uh, because there's a lot at stake. People are watching us, and we do want to earn that credibility so that we can not just have convictions about the word of God and understand the prophecy of the future, but we'll be able to communicate that clearly to them. Let's pray. Lord, we do thank you for all that's ours in, in Jesus Christ, that our citizenship is in, in heaven, and we eagerly await a Savior from there, the Lord Jesus Christ. Lord, but you have us here now, and in schools and in work and military, different positions around the state. Lord, and uh, friends that we can influence, family members that are looking to us, uh, and you've really called us to be uh, a witness that we might earn a right with some sense of credibility to share our faith. Lord, and uh, yet your word tells us in Proverbs that the fear of man is a snare, and we recognize that it is. So we pray for just your spirit to be upon us, that we might be the witnesses that you've called us to be. Lord, use, use our lives. We, uh, we sense that the, the time is near, Lord. Help us make, make use of the time that uh, you've given us. In Jesus' name, amen.